few years that I've been speaking at Chicago Quality Assurance Association, uh, and uh, it's it's always a pleasure to come back and, and present and do something fun. All right, uh, so to get started, uh, as uh, Mary Jo had mentioned, uh, I do have some YouTube videos out there. I've got enough followers so that I have a custom URL. It's Paul Grossman, The Dark Arts Wizard, that you can go and check out some cool videos. Uh, today we're going to be talking about integrating low code automation solutions into our uh, into the field into our application uh, testing of our applications there are two tools that are out there there's uh, test rigor which I've been working with for about two years I just recently came across also test Sigma now, I've got more experience working with test rigor we will have some demos uh, and uh, they will be on test rigor but I do encourage you to check out both these companies to take a look at what they do there's very similar and um, it's uh it's uh, they're 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 pretty cool. So to continue on, um, I think most of this was already covered by Mary Jo. I've worked in a lot of tools like HP, VB Script, UFT, uh, Cucumber, Selenium. Uh, most recently, I worked in WebDriver IO and JavaScript, and a whole bunch of different clients as she uh, as she mentioned there. Uh, and I'm currently a project manager, so I get about ten people running as SDETs. And then I am working to help with another project manager who has, she has another 10 people working, uh, doing manual testing out there. So a little bit what we're going to get out of this session. I'm going to talk about a case study that occurred about a year ago. It's a midnight manual testing uh, challenge with a low-code test automation tool. I'll show you a little bit of the differences between what you've got for natural language processing and uh, in code and versus a actual uh, NLP uh, tool. And I'm going to have a couple of demos in there where we'll talk about if you can do this without CSS or XPath, can you data drive stuff, can you reuse uh, use a lot of the functionality that, that the developers understand, you know, having the reuse of, of code to reduce our amount of, uh, of code that's in our full platform. And then um, a couple other things like detecting unexpected issues. There's some demos and a little bit of code. Uh, so I'm going to get started here with this case study. Uh, this was working for a mortgage company a couple of years, uh, just like I said, last year. On a Thursday night, we had been asked, or Thursday afternoon, I've been asked uh, that they were going to have a new release of uh, systems. We had just acquired a new company, and we had 150 brand new employees, and we needed to do four validation points in order to check that each one of the 150 new employees were going to be uh, were set up and the data was correct. Uh, they were also going to re push this out uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday night, so we were going to get online at around 11 o'clock at night, Sunday night, and we expected about three hours with uh, five, four or five people on the call checking all of these data points. And they asked, is it possible we could use automation to maybe get this done a little bit faster? Now, Keep in mind, I already had my side job, my, my, my uh, day job, uh, which was writing a lot of code in JavaScript. And now I also had this Thursday uh, uh, meeting over here. I do have my phone on. It will, it may uh, give off some things, but it's part of the demo. So uh, please bear with me if you hear a couple of more dings like that. Uh, to continue on, uh, the, the uh, result was I was able to set up this test in about 90 minutes. Uh, we found and fixed 76 defects in the 600 data points, and we were done uh, within an hour and a half. Just to take a look at this, this is exactly what they asked me to do. Uh, go to their website, click on a button, enter the uh, each user loan officer's name into a field, uh, and then uh, click on that name as a link. Go click Apply Now as another link and then verify the name, the phone number, the email, and the ID. And in fact, they snuck one other one and they said, hey, check, see if the ID is in the URL as well. And they also want to have a capture of a step at each, uh, uh, at each step, a capture of a screen capture, and if possible, a video of the process. We needed to repeat that 36 times out of a CSV, so it was definitely data-driven. Like I said, I was able to build this in a non, in a codeless tool in about 90 minutes. Each test took about 41 seconds to execute, and aside from the, uh, oh, we did find one defect, by the way, uh, and in fact, it was in that first 90 minutes of just building it Thursday afternoon, which was this. Uh, if we typed in 
the loan officer's name into the field to go search it. If you typed in the first name, it was fine. You would find it. But if you had the next three characters in there, it would go, I, I don't know who you're talking about. And it wasn't a misspelling. It was the, the, the name was correct. But about 34 of these, use, these uh, new employees, it said, when you type this in, it's not there. We don't know who it is. So we actually uh, found one defect just in the first hour of working on this, which was pretty impressive. And by the way, those 36 uh, names, they were being uh, replicated in five uh, other CSV files. There were 36 other names in five other files, which got us over to that 150 new users that were in there. It's pretty cool. Got it done. Everybody got home. Uh, like I said, started at 11. We're done by, we were done by 1230 hour and a half we didn't stay up to have to stay up till two o'clock in the morning it was pretty impressive talk a little, i'll show a little bit of demos of some, stuff similar to that um the next thing i want to talk about is uh when we're talking about tools like this we we actually have some new terminology it's no one's probably ever heard of this but uh it's specific specification driven development so we we have our older uh approaches. We've got TDD, test-driven development, where we're writing a test that fails because the developers haven't written the application functionality yet. When they do have it in there, we run the test again, it passes, and then we refactor our code and keep going around in circles like this in order to stay ahead of the game and have our test cases available as the developers are writing their, their code. We also have BDD, behavioral different driven development, just basically Cucumber or spec flow, where we have given, when, then, and we are essentially trying to get more non-technical users, our manual testers, to be able to write our test scripts and uh, data drive these with uh, examples of data embedded in our test or even having data being in a uh, data table uh, out, outside of, outside of the, uh, the framework and being added that in there. The problem is, is that you still need that glue code. You still need the stats in order to write all that to connect this to the code in the background. And what we'd like to do is try and get rid of that. And specification-driven development does that. In our stages, we have a project manager who, you know, basically, if you look at it, it's they write the, the, the functional spec, right? It's in plain English. Our engineers try to code that functionality, so they kind of reinterpret that spec, and hopefully they're unit, unit testing it. And at stage three, our SDETs developers get to do the same thing over again, write code to test the spec that was written in stage one. The interesting in specification-driven development is that our spec is written in plain English. What if our SDETs could go just write this in plain English? In fact, it doesn't have to be the SDETs. It could be our manual testers. Just write plain English tests without having to know anything about the code or have anybody writing glue code and stuff like that. So basically, specification-driven development uh, is, is writing the tests before the code implementation, that there, and also having... Uh, non-technical users write their scripts and kind of skip the stages. That would make things go oh, so much faster if we could just condense that. When you're doing a uh, do-it-yourself coded framework, there's a lot of things that you may not realize from day one that you're going to eventually need. You, know, you need a, a relative element location. I have a radio button, but it doesn't have the name male or female on it. It's next to another element, a div, that says male, another one that says female. How am I going to have to get and click on a radio button like that? It needs to be data-driven. We need to add variables. We need to include, at some point, CICD scheduled execution so we can run our tests overnight, um, implement that modular design, and then catch errors uh, as we go. Well, that's what, what we're there to do, you either catch errors or, if you want to think of it the other way, um, make sure that our application didn't break when they put out new, new code uh, out, out into the, uh, into the environment. Someone's going to ask you for screen captures and some sort of nice report, like with Allure. With a cloud-based codeless platform, you get all of that in the same thing, except we don't have all the code that's involved in there. And in fact, some of them can text and call your phone, even check your email, and do that out of the box, and even have the history uh, on that uh, when, when it's uh, executing, so you can take a look back a day, a week, a month, maybe even years, to see if something's changed. Now, one of the things I, I tell you, I am an SDET, I write in code all the time. It seems to be kind of counterintuitive that I would look at a code, codeless tool uh, application, but I assure you, 
I like to keep both of these going because it's like burning a candle at both ends. Keep in mind the curse of code density. How much code would we need to do if I needed to click on the Add to Cart button on, on this uh, button over here? If I did it in Java, it's seven lines of code, 283 characters. And each time you need to type a character, that's a little bit of time you're taking from your eight-hour day. I want to do things faster. If I did it in VB Script, well, I could do it in four lines of code in UFT. It's 136 characters. But the execution time, because it's basically basic, uh, runs a little slower. So we need to be able to, you can write test kit faster, but, uh, and it is an easier language, but it's also you know, not the most popular one that's out there either. If we get down to JavaScript, we could do it in three codes with Cypress out here. Just Cy contains add to cart and go click on it, which is pretty cool. And then if you do it in a, non, in a uh, um, natural language processing tool like test rigor, you could just say click add to cart. Who believes that? You know what? We'll stick with Java. We'll just have ChatGPT over there go and write our, all our code for us. I'm hoping somebody out there is using ChatGPT to go find out how well it writes code. It, it does an okay job. All right. Anyway, moving on. Uh, let's say we just we really wanted to do this. We want to write a parser in plain English that will take a string, click on the Add to Cart button, uh, Add to Cart link, and go and uh, click on it. We do it in Selenium over here. You'd have to get the string. Uh, oh, well, basically, we want to take this English and convert it to this code over here, or convert it into base uh, VB script over here. And if we did it in test rigor, as I said, click add to cart would be the way we could do it. If we're doing it in code, what we'd have to do is parse out everything. So we've got our sentence. Click the add to cart button and parse it out by spaces or split it if we're doing it in VB script or uh, doing a sentence split if we're doing it in Java in Selenium. And then we take our click the add to cart and we have to divide it up into uh, six different uh, elements that we'll need to find. Our verbs, articles, the element name and type. Uh, relative location if it's needed, and any data that we're picking up as we go along. So if I were to break that up, our first step would be to go and find our verbs, or like our clicks, our grab and saves out here. Well, we got to click on the add uh, link button, and then we'd remove that from the string. And our grab would say, you know, maybe uh, we, uh, we would also maybe need to generate some data on the fly. So we'd have to add one more functionality, generate by regex so that we could have random strings out here. Just generate A to Z 10 times, get a nice random string that we could stick into a variable somewhere. And our grab would have to be identified that saying, oh yeah, we're gonna save this into a variable. It's a complex uh, 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 approach to, to do this. Our second step, once we got rid of that out of our string, we'd have to get rid of our articles on and the. We could also use into and from with enter and select to actually identify whether we're working with a list or a, um, uh, or a uh, input field. Of course, we have to, like I said, support grab and save over there. Next, we have to extract our element type. Well, we've gotten rid of our, uh, our article, so now we've got an element type, link, list, field. And again, we might need to uh, make an assumption. If we don't have that word in there, we could say select may from the month. We don't say list, but we know that we're doing select and from. It's going to be, have to be a list element that we're looking for. Next, we extract our name identifier, which is the link, the list, add to cart link, or a month list, and then create our element out of that. And uh, uh, as I said in this, we have to assume that this is a text field because we're grabbing a value like uh, from a most populated zip and go pull it off of our screen. We've almost entirely replaced all of our values out there. We still would have to maybe extract a location, a relative location. We're looking for a value that's located after the most popular zip. That would be 60130 on our example over here and save it as a variable in the zip code variable. But this is actually a link, so it may not actually be a div. To be able to have to write some code to, to identify and say, I'm looking for an element that is next to this guy over here. What a lot of interesting code. And by the way, you'd want to have to identify relative location by something that's above, below, left, or right, at the top of the screen, the middle screen, below the screen. You have to have a lot of so additional code support just to make this all work, converting a string into code. 
And lastly, well, the last thing we have, only thing we've got left, we've gotten rid of everything over here is uh, our data. Uh, we want to put May into a month, or maybe we want to enter Paul into a name field. Well, there's a name field over there, adding the word Paul in there. The only thing we've got left is our data, but we'd also have to support complex compound sentences. Like do this, grab a value, and go and save it into a variable called zip code. Once you got all that code written, yeah, you're 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 it's a breeze, right? <laughs> Let me take a look uh, uh, for a moment over here. How would you actually want to uh, do a click on an element? If we did it in, uh, I think this is JavaScript over here that I'm doing it in. Uh, we'd have to have a button called register. If I wanted to go register for this seminar that we're having today, uh, I'd have to go and create a locator for it, and then have uh, Selenium go and find that locator. And then uh, basically have a, a, a custom click method that would say, let's go see, well, before I click on it, make sure it's clickable, maybe make sure it's visible, and then go click on it. And by the way, if it's not there, if we couldn't click on it, stop that whole test and say it's failed. Now, I've been talking for a little bit of a while. It's kind of boring, so let's go take a look at a demo. How does this look if we were to actually say click on the register button? I'm going to switch over to our test trigger. Uh, example over here. I'm going to go into one of our sample tests that I've got already set up for this particular uh, demo. If I go over to this test over here, I'm going to go and take a look inside of this. This is uh, we're going to go to validate on our CQAA website. We're going to jump to the event that you're watching right now and go and click on the register button. I'm going to go hit and say retest. And basically what this is doing is it is setting up a environment in the cloud. Uh, it is a Linux environment that is running a Chrome browser. And as soon as it's up and running, it will go and clear out all these images from my last run. And it will show us exactly what it's doing. Just cleared it out and basically jumped to it. Now we're jumping to our Kendo React, which is a, a demo I'm going to do near, near the end over here. Uh, which is the default, uh, it would be our basically our QA environment. But we want to jump by jumping over to opening the URL to this event and going over here and seeing what we've got. Ah, now I've had a, uh, a, a great thing over here is that I didn't actually have a uh, refresh on this. So this is kind of cool. We actually had a screen capture. It's saying, hey, something went horribly wrong. I couldn't find that register button. I'm going to give this another retest over here. It might be that we're all, a bunch of people are hitting that website. I'm going to give it one more shot because I know on the previous run, it did pass. Now, how do I know that it passed? Maybe I'm just making that up. Uh, this is in the queue. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go click on my edit test case over here. And I'm going to show you that this is the test we're doing. We are want to go and click on the register button, check the page contains, description of this session that you're watching and even enter in my my uh, email into the email field now, I know that it ran over here uh, we had a, a, a run over here because I basically jumped into this and I can see my screen captures over here where we went from Kendo we went to the CQAA we found the register button over here if I click on it next it says click register down here and it says, it highlights it and says, yep, there was a register button. I found it and I clicked right in the middle of it. Kind of cool. And then the next thing I said was over here was, did you go check the page contains some sort of uh, data? We need to do a validation. Is this the CQA February investigating low code automation uh, solutions? It is. And uh, last thing I also said was go enter dark arts wizard into the email field. Notice there's no CSS. There's no XPath in here. It figured out which one. And in fact, the name of this field is personal email address. Put a capital E over there. Didn't even put in the full name. I just, I was so lazy. I said, let's just go see if you can find a field called email and go throw in my email into it. And then jump to uh, the next, uh, the line we we're doing a little bit more. I'm getting a little ahead of my demo. So I'm going to go and close this out and come back over here. I'm giving it a second run. Guess what? We're having uh, uh, a second run that is uh, failing over there. I'm going to have to go take a look at that and see what exactly is going on. 
but we do have other demos that we're, we're going to go continue on with. Let me go back over to my uh, system. Over One of the great things is that it actually does give us information. What What is actually going around over here? If I hit click on more details, it'll say there's some error information. What is it? It says it can't find this particular element. And if we go to the URL, I wonder if I pasted the wrong URL. I'm going to just jump to it. That seems to be working fine. Okay. I'm going to go back to our presentation over here, and we'll come back to another demo in just a second here. All right. So in order to click on a button, I did click on a register button. By the way, if we were to write this in code and we have our own uh, framework, we might want to make this flexible enough so that if I said click on the register button or click the register button, I forgot the word and on in there, or click register button and just left out the article, click register button or just said click register, which I think is that's the actual demo that I did. Um, even if it's lowercase, it would be able to, to identify it uh, because uh, our tool should be able to not force us to do a lot of maintenance. If, uh, if there's a change in case, we should put out some information that, hey, the case changed, but we still find the element and try and get ourselves to our endpoint of doing our validation. And it's kind of hard to even figure out what kind of element you got over there because there's a whole lot of descriptions of what that element would look like for our register button over there. All right, let me go on to the next thing. Um, Next one is, let's say, remember I said we click on that button and it stopped. But in some cases, we may have a button that has a different, elect, different, uh, uh, a different description in our production, uh, in our QA department versus our QA environment versus our dev environment. And it may be even different from our uh, from our production environment as well. Our locator is slightly different. So what happens if we click on it? It's not there, but we want the test to continue on. You say, hey, if you see this, if this button is here go click on it. And if it doesn't, don't stop the test. Don't fail over here. Well, in the coded version in WebDriver.io, I had to go write my own custom method called click if exists, which says, okay, click it. And if you threw an error, it wasn't clickable, but hey, don't don't stop the test. Just keep on going. Uh, in a colossal uh, approach, we'd have click bogus if it exists and then enter some saved value into my name. I'm using bogus as my the name of the element that just doesn't uh, exist. So if I did do click bogus, it would not come back. Let's go see if um, I can get that to demo over here. Let's go try one of my other. Let's see if I do a demo. Which one am I going to grab? I'll grab modular design, which I have run. I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to go check, change this test case to say, click, bogus, if exists, and spell, well, it doesn't spell quite right there. Click bogus, if exists. I'm going to update and retest it and see if we get a slightly different approach on that. If I continue to have issues, I'm going to go change this to a different operating system and browser and see if that takes care of stuff. This is one of the great things about doing live demos is that you never know what you're going to expect. Um, I've been a, a pessimist uh, about test automation for a very long time. Any test case that didn't run 15 minutes ago, I don't believe is actually going to go run. Check this out. It is actually found our CQAA the way I expected it to, so that's cool. And it switched over to our URL. And the next thing was I said, click bogus if it exists. But bogus doesn't, doesn't exist on here. There's no button called bogus. And then it says, uh, you know, check that the page contains who we are, and then click the learn button. It's actually taking three of my lines of code and combining them together in one thing. So it said, hey, yes, I did do a validation the text who we are exists right here. And I clicked on learn, learn about our membership. By the way, learn all lowercase, learn about membership all uppercase. Didn't care. Didn't even have the whole string. Still found it out there. This is pretty cool. And like I said, click bogus if exists, uh, did not fail the test. If it did, it would show us a nice red uh, message out there. 
So that was kind of a demonstration of that. I'm going to go to one more quick test just to prove. If I say click on bonus and I say don't have that there, I'm going to update and retest it. We'll give it a few seconds to go back and through. And it should say, hey, I couldn't find a button named bogus out there. What kind of bogus presentation are you doing over here? What kind of bogus test is this? So uh, as I said, the environment is running in the background, coming up. And we do have a few seconds where it will wait for an element to appear. Uh, there is customizable timeouts that you have. And here, it just did it again. You know what? I know what the issue is. One second here. The issue is that I made a change for speed optimizations. So I'm going to make it wait more than 10 seconds on our pages. So that's me. At least I know how to fix it, and I know who broke it. There we go. Let's go back and give it one more shot. In fact, uh, let's see. It actually did do 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 it correctly. It did take a screen capture of an empty screen as the screen was building, and then it actually got out to CQAA out there, and it said, you know, what we wanted to do was click on the bogus button, but it says, hey, there's no bug button called bogus. Not only that, test case came out as red, and it ended uh, our execution. So uh, that's our demo of uh, what you can do in plain English when you have a button that may or may not exist out there. I'm going to go switch this back real quick to, uh, in fact, I'll just take bogus out of it because well, I want this all to run at the end. Take bogus out of there. And we will just save it. We go back over to my presentation over here. We've gotten through this. Next thing is testing in plain English, set value, uh, entering the dark arts wizard into an email field. I actually did this uh, just moments ago, uh, putting in my email uh, field uh, uh, into the into our uh, site, site over there as we are registering. If I wanted to do it as coding, well, this is why you do it. There's an email field out there with the name email. Notice I'm using contains inside of my locators out there because it might have different ways that email is written. In fact, I might even drop off the E because you never know. It might be have a capital E in there. I might just say, hey, go find me an input that has mail in the name of the element. And then go and uh, interact with that. Click on the set value. Oh, what are we doing over here? I've got a custom set value over here that says, hey, if the set value is clickable, then go and set the value. This is actually telling me that it exists. Rather than doing it two times to say it's exist and enabled, I just say, is it clickable? Yes, go and set the value. A little bit faster execution. I'm always looking for trying to find a way to do it faster. And another question is, if we didn't, if we didn't find this field, we didn't, and weren't able to enter data into it, should we end the test right there? Or should we keep, try and keep going? In that case, it's really up to you on your design and your framework. I try to populate as many fields as possible. The only time I really stop is if a, if a, uh, if a button doesn't exist. Okay. Next thing we're going to talk about is, hey, there should be modular design. So I've got this uh, field called Enter Birthday. And I'm putting in the month, the day, and the year. But then I'm going to do it again. I'm going to change it to next month, yesterday, uh, born yesterday, actually uh, 366 days ago, yesterday and last year. And then all this doesn't need to be re replicated. We just put it into a uh, birth date that says go and select this information, uh, month, day, and year. And we're passing it in each time over there. So we're reusing this code rather than typing it into every single test case. No, much more uh, um, more usable. We could do the same thing in this uh, uh, approach. We could say select a, a saved value of month, day, and year, pass it in there, and put it into a reusable modular uh, code. A reusable rule is what we call it in, in test trigger. So I'm going to go and take a look at my forgot password test, and I'm going to go and see where we can do that. I remember where I forgot password was. Boy, if only I could search it. Or got, see if I get a test out of this. Yeah, it's actually copied in a whole bunch of my test cases out here. Let's see, I'm gonna go grab this one. 
I'm going to do a quick edit over here and see where is forgot password. Ah, forgot password is right at the bottom there. So I'm going to go and click on login. We want to check uh, some other stuff there that we have bad passwords, emails. Let me go and take a look and see if we have this. I'm entering bogus into my email, and basically we're going and entering in data with a bogus email. By the way, I can't get by past recapture. I would love to do a demo where I actually register with CQAA, but they've got recapture on that. If you're ever in an automation field where you've got recapture turned on, the thing to do is to whitelist your URL so that this doesn't appear. Recapture actually has it already implemented because we've been doing that for many, many decades. They know about it, so you don't necessarily have to have this pop up and block you as an automation engineer. I put in bogus as my email. I put in a bad uh, p email as as that, and then I'm going forward. And the next thing was to to uh, hit recapture, uh, to make sure the page has recapture. I have it's a little smaller, but it, yeah, it validated. It's right there, and then click on the forget password field out there. So I've clicked on forget password, and then I'm going to go and enter in my email into that. And the, um, oh, yes, I'm sorry. What we're going to do here is I am going to go and make this a reusable rule over here. So I'm going to go and say anything that contains these two lines over here, I'm going to copy that. I'm going to close it. I'm going to go over to a reusable rule. I'm going to go paste that code over here. And we're going to say uh, check forgot password. Put in uppercase so that it stands out. And then I'm going to go and say and say save and replace all the steps. You'll see every test that I've got it in there is listed out there. I could say, oh, I'll, I only want these guys, but not this one to be uh, changed. I'll change them all. I've replaced them all. If I go back over to my test case and take a look at our edits, we should see that's not one of the ones that it changed it on. Let's try that again. Um, let me go to our top one over here. I'll go edit this. And at the bottom, we now have check forgot password, replace those two lines of code. Uh, and that's where we've got our modular design. And if I go and open up a second one, which is just a copy, basically for this demo, same thing. The two lines of code that were in there are now replaced by a reusable modular uh, module that if anything ever changes, I would just go and change it on the rules over here for check forgot password. And Let's say I don't want to click on forgot password or I want to validate, check something that, that occurred after that. I can go change it, and every one of my test cases that uses this gets the update. All right, so we've got reusable code, just like we do as a programmer. Catch unexpected error. Well, I don't even know how I would write that in, in there. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do is check out my warning messages in uh, the modular design test three. It says in test three, I've got it. So I'm going to go back over to my test cases over here and see if we can pick up something we weren't even looking for. So if I go over here to um, look over to this guy, I'm going to go edit my test case. Actually, I think I can go. No, nope, this is fine. I'm going to look back at my last passing run over here. And you'll notice at the very beginning, there's one of my uh, items is uh, in a different color. These guys are all kind of greenish, but this one's not red. It's actually kind of yellowish, and it's well, basically saying there's a warning. There's something going on that's horribly wrong. If I go over here and take a look at the errors, it says, when we hit the Telerik website, which is the original site that I was going to uh, go hit, and we'll, we'll take a look at it, it's actually throwing out a few things at us that uh, are not good. There's a couple of uncaught errors. They couldn't load this particular page. And some of the page resources for this are not found on that page. This looks bad, doesn't it? It says it's a JavaScript severe error, and yet the page still built. 
the page will still uh, continue on. But whether this is something that a manual tester or even a software test automation engineer could pick up and catch, I certainly wouldn't know about it. I don't go looking into the background to try and figure out what's out there that we could we could uh, fix uh, or that might be throwing an error. This is something great that I can just throw over to a developer and say, hey guys, I'm picking up on this. It's not impacting our users. We're not losing any money, but it might be some sort of time bomb that's going to blow up sometime in the future. Take a look at it. See if this is something useful that you guys might should be aware of. I think it's pretty cool that uh, we're able to pick up on, on that. And I didn't write anything in the code that says go and uh, go find this. It just does it automatically behind the scenes and does, does a little bit of extra checking on that. And that's one of the features I really like about uh, most tools. Uh, I know TestRigger does it. I think Test Sigma does it as well. And um, I have to go ask them directly to see if that, that, that works. And uh, if not, they'll probably add it in there because that's a neat, neat feature. All right, so I've caught an unexpected error. What else do I have here? Let's get really complex. You want to automate and validate that something appears on a table. So let's go to that Kendo React table. I'm going to go take a look at that guy over here. We'll go back to our test cases. And I believe the Kendo is down at my bottom over here. It takes about 17 seconds to validate. Let's go take a look at what it actually does. It is navigating to our Kendo website, our default, by the way. The default website we're jumping to for all these things is the Telerik uh, React Components Grid demo over here. And if I go over here to our bottom, it will always, each one of these test cases navigates to that, and then you can go to different places from there. And if I do a quick edit, it says click accept. Well, why am I clicking accept? Because there is an accept uh, button that comes up there and says accept cookies. We should accept the cookies. So we'll accept those every time we do that. And lastly, the uh, check the page contains January 13th to the left of this particular number, 10702. Obviously, those could be parameterized, and you could data drive those. Um, in this case, we have 10702 listed in the ID uh, field, and it is identifying that uh, January 13th, Monday, January 13th, 1997, is identified. It tells us exactly what row it's in and where it found it. Pretty cool. I don't even have the code to tell you how to do this in uh, uh, coding in, in uh, tables. Um, automation, automation engineering of, of tables is like the hardest thing. And mostly because there are two different types of tables. You could actually have a table that's built with uh, TR, TD elements, or you could have a table that just does not exist. Uh, it's just, I'm sorry, it's just built, built out of divs, which is even trickier. By the way, TestRigger can handle both of those. It's kind of cool. Uh, let me go back over to our next thing. You kind of showed how a Kendo uh, React table uh, can be done. And let me check my time. I actually have, I think I'm running, oh, I'm running four minutes early. Cool. All right. Last thing I want to talk about is, can we do cross-platform testing or concurrent execution or advanced monitoring? This is, as I said, running inside of a, um, inside of just one environment, uh, Ubuntu, uh, Chrome over here. And, uh, but I could add, more environments. I could say I want to test it out on Windows. I want to see if it works on Edge. And I also want to check it out on a Mac and make sure it works on a Safari. Uh, full disclosure, I have not run this test yet. <laughs> so I don't know that all of these will work, but we're going to do a nice little combination of that. I'm going to save those off there. And uh, also I have this set up to go, you could do CICD with Jenkins, but it has a built-in CICD. So we could go and monitor and say, hey, I want to run this test uh, every hour, every four hours, every 12 hours, every 24 hours, starting at 12.50 p.m. Let's see what time we got right now. It is currently uh, 12.46. So I am going to go and change this to 12.47. On Wednesday, I'm going to save it. 
And I'm going to go back over my test suites, and we're going to have to wait a minute and see what happens out here. So that monitoring is out there is basically saying, um, as I said, it, it will run all the test cases out here. As you can see, everything is basically hasn't been uh, run. I had them all canceled here, so I know which ones I had executed, which ones I hadn't. We're going to have them all run, and in, in fact, one of them is going to go over there and send a text to my phone saying send an SMS that says, what about a video? We'll come to that in just a second. And the second one says, call my phone over here. And this one says, call a uh, saved value to Dark Arts phone number and call my Twilio number. That data is stored over here. There's my Twilio phone number if you want to call it. I don't know why you would, but nobody will answer. And this is my Dark Arts Wizard phone number. But that Dark Arts Wizard number I don't want to give out to everybody. By the way, that was just a ding. These are a whole bunch of uh, messages that are coming in. Let me show them there. They're all saying, what about a video, a demo? Uh, hopefully you can see that in my recording screen. Let's see if I extend it out here. And we'll try that one more time. So all those all those systems are sending me up messages that say, what about a video? What about a video? Oh, by the way, that's my Twilio uh, uh, phone number calling me. A couple of them are calling me. So, yes, I actually got it to send me a couple of messages, give me a couple of phone calls, and verify that those things are, are working. They're all running at the same time. They all, all I didn't click anything to get it off. It was just from that execution where we said run all my test cases in the next minute. Some of them are currently passing. And by the way, I'm going to go and open up one of these test uh, things over here and jump to this link. And we should actually see all of these executing under each different environment. Ubuntu, Windows, Ubuntu, uh, Chrome, Windows Edge, Safari. Uh, Safari uh, Mac. So these are all my test cases running concurrently uh, at the same time. Looks like Mac is having a problem. We'll have to go investigate that, but I can guarantee you that uh, our test cases are working under uh, Ubuntu and Windows. In fact, I'm going to go back, and that's, as I said, running concurrently. I'm going to go back one second here. We've got two test cases that are still running over here. By the way, if I open these guys up, Let's say I open this one over here. We can see that these are the results for Chrome. This is the results for Edge. This is the results for Safari. All of them got screen captures out there. OK, one of them took a long time to complete, but it is actually finishing up. It sent me, and it's probably going to give me a phone call again in just a minute because I uh, did this. In, um, oh, we had one test case that actually failed out here. It's always good to have a failure. I'm okay with that. Uh, Edge and Safari. Safari basically said it could not complete this particular test case. However, the uh, Edge, I believe Windows Edge, worked perfectly fine, got to an end uh, point, and so did our Windows Chrome get over to an end. So one of these three uh, test cases running concurrently in the cloud worked, um, uh, worked and failed, but we have a right over here saying, hey, you should go check this out. So I just ran all of these environments, all these test cases, all at the same time concurrently out there. Something you always want to have uh, in order to get your results faster. As you remember at my beginning, I told you that story. We had 150 validations to do 150 users. We ran them five users at a time uh, using this particular tool, which was kind of cool. There's where your time savings are. Last thing, I think, let's go take a look back at my presentation. Let's see, um, blah, blah, blah. Some fun stuff I'm doing is I'm using it to go and check to see if my spin ID is uh, popping up on Wheel of Fortune. I got a one in a million shot of that, probably one in 10 million. Uh, but what the heck, if it ever pops up and says, hey, your number was uh, on their website, go call up and go claim some prizes out there. There's one thing I don't have over here. We got time to do one last uh, check which was, of course, the one that failed out here, which is interesting. Um, 
on the three different approaches. We've got, I actually had set up um, to have this test case go and try to log in with different users. I've set up a test data over here, data set called bad login names. And these are my bad login names under my rows. One of them is bogus. And then the second one is uh, bozo. And the third one is Stephen King's It. We got a little clown theme going on over there. So if I go over and take a look at this test case that is actually linked, any one of these could be linked to a data set. This one actually is. And if I open it up, it'll show us three different versions. This actually got executed nine times, three times under three different operating systems, three different browsers. So if I go to second one, which is bad credit, and I'm going to go and open up this guy, it will say Bozo the Clown was the the uh, at the circus.com. And if I go to Scary Clown, that's going to show me that it was Pennywise at the Dairy Council. Oh, Pennywise got on the Dairy Council. That's good. All right, good for Dairy. Cool. Um, and it basically completed. I think I can jump to this and see all of our executions in all of our uh, environments going through that it ran all different copies of this. Three different data, first uh, bad credit, the second bad credit, and the evil clown, uh, scary clown over here got ran. All three of them under Ubuntu, Chrome, and Safari, and one of them blew up in the middle. What happened? Let's go take a look. Website temporarily unavailable. Really? Well, at least we got proof of it. Took screen captures of it. Hey, you know, there's one last thing to do before I wrap this up, and that is, can we actually get video of what this looks like? And the advanced answer to that is, of course we can. If I go to integrations, I turn on record video, and I hit save down here. I'm going to go run one of our short tests that passed. Oh, and I'm going to go, uh, just for speed, I'm going to go and get rid of our multiple browsers. We'll ditch those there. Go back to that. And back to our test cases. And which one passed the, to, this one took, text my phone, took eight seconds to occur. Uh, that's not a good one because there's no video involved in it. So I'm going to go validate the this uh, site. We're going to go hit retest. That's about 13 seconds. And with that running out there, I'll let that chug away. Um, just a reminder, I guess there were some questions. We, if you have any questions about what's going on, you can always ask. I see all of your names over here, by the way. Cool to see. There's Mary Jo. And um, if there's any questions that came up, uh, we can it's spread a couple in chat. Cool, yeah. What's going on? Ask me, ask something automation engineer. Uh, first uh, question, can you run test rigor against mobile sites? Yes, mobile you can. Yeah, if I go over here to my all my test scripts, and if I go to create a brand new one, we could do uh, mobile web testing or native and hybrid uh, mobile testing. So yes, it can do that. That is awesome. And uh, I have I think this is what this means, so chime in if I'm interpreting this wrong. Uh, have you done it against e-commerce uh, applications? Uh, this tool? Yeah, almost uh, um, anything that's, you know, uh, you're saying if it's a, a public website on that. Uh, cost, uh, they're asking about the cost of, of, uh, of this. Let me see if I can get to the costs on that. I think I have to go log out. Uh, yeah, because it's almost anything that's that's got a public website e-commerce, you can do it. Uh, and it, actually, to be a little bit more specific, I know everybody uses, um, oh, for API testing, uh, we're usually using... Um, Postman? Uh, yeah, Postman. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that is correct. It says $900 a month on their website uh, on that. It is unlimited numbers of uh, uh, users, by the way. It's not limited by users. It's not limited by number of executions. Uh, what it is... Uh, 900 is actually one, what well, they call it a parallelization. So for $900, you get one project, and it's just one uh, 
in the cloud. For $1,800, you get two, and they would run concurrently. You could also share those between two projects. We have, I've got like a whole bunch of projects, so I could have CQAA and Zapple Tech over here running at the same time. They would share those if they ran it at the same time. If you just ran one and then the other, then it would just use two. Uh, the more you the more you buy uh, uh, virtualizations you get, the more projects you get, so you could add in uh, mobile testing and stuff like that. How good is it to check a PDF content within a breath? Good question. <laughs> All right, whoever asked that one, excellent job. Uh, I have never done a PDF test, but let me go back over and do a quick check because I believe I've seen PDF listed in there. I think it's under settings. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm going to do a different way. I'm going to go over to my resources and go to documentation over here. I'm just going to do a search for PDF and see what we get. I get five references. Uh, check the SMS. Check that a file is downloaded and check its contents. Uh, check that downloaded file agreement PDF contains agreements. So I'm going to say yes, it does that. <laughs> oh, by the way, there's examples. You can click on these examples and jump in there. Uh, it is There is an open source version. The test cases are all uh, basically anyone can go find them, but there, I think there's about a million of them, so you're kind of hiding within about a million test cases. But you can jump in there and, and go and test, uh, test it out, work, play around with it uh, out there. Um, what other, other questions qu we got? A couple yeah. other questions in the chat. Um, is it only an SAS tool, or can you install it on-prem if you wanted to? You, it can be installed on-premise. Uh, the way they set that up is there's, well, I'm not sure if that answer is totally correct, but what you can do is if it's, uh, you can set up a tunnel and uh, have it uh, tunnel in in order to interact with your uh, your lower environments that uh, are you know, private, not open to anybody else. So if I did authentication, Roxy, what am I looking for? You would set up a, um, a tunnel, uh, either standard or encrypted uh, proxy. So you put a tunnel over there and get in. All right. And then could you test uh, Windows apps, i.e. executable files? Not as of yet. In fact, I think Test Sigma actually does that. Uh, test Rigor, uh, they're working on that. Everybody's asking for that uh, to test on a uh, on a desktop uh, application. So I'm, I'm hoping they'll have it soon. I'm told it is coming, but I don't have any dates or times on that. So. Great. I think that hits all the questions in chat, um, unless anyone's got one last question they want to pop in there. Paul, thank you for your time today and showing us this tool. Looks like a lot generated lots of interest in it. Um, yeah. I'm assuming there's like a demo people could try it out if yeah. if they're interested in it. Uh, T e s t r i g o r dot um. There we go. I jump over there. Um, good answer for that off the top of my head. Question: Now let's start a free chat. Yes, let's try a free chat. I'll click on this guy over here, get started, and pop in some information. Register now. And the next thing you know, you can you've got your own environment that you can jump into. That great. Well, thank you, Paul. We're out of time, sure. um, but we'll again we'll post these slides and ho the recording hopefully on the CQA website in a few days, and uh, hope everyone can join us next month for our quality maturity model webinar. Thank you, everybody.